Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Global Peace Film Festival Lives Online. Tonight, we are going to have a conversation with Holly Mosher to discuss Pay to Play and other of her current projects. I want to welcome you all. Uh, uh, as you know, um, uh, we also have a film festival uh, that we are planning this September. It will be our 18th. Uh, we have lots of things that we are working on, and we are going to be rolling out that information as things fall into place. But we just wanted to uh, prime everybody uh, uh, to anticipate that our September festival will um, roll out starting September 21st, and look forward to all of those updates. And Nina, I'll turn things over to you. Well, hello everyone and welcome Holly Mosher. It's great to have you with us. It's been, a, it's been a while since we've seen each other and so it's lovely to get together again. Um, Holly has had two films in the Global Peace Film Festival in the, in the past. The first one was Bonsai People, uh, which was about Muhammad Yunus, um, a wonderful film. And then we showed Pay to Play, um, which is what we're really going to talk about now. So, because it's about elections, which of course we have a major critically important election coming up in November um, and primaries before that. Uh, so Holly, can you first of all, tell us a little bit about, about pay to play and also how people can, you know, uh, people can see it for free now. So um, tell people how they can do that. Yes, yeah, so we made the movie Pay to Play about the problem, the corrupting influence of money in politics. And we're kind of seeing the culmination of, you know, what that can lead to with someone like Trump in office. Just, um, you know, the abuses of money power and, you know, he's just raking in millions <laughs> to his businesses. And, you know, we don't even know the foreign influence and all that's buying. So that's what happens when our system gets so corrupted over time. And um, we we lay out a six solution set in the film, you know, how we could get big money out of politics and take our democracy back. And we also tried to make the fun, the film very fun. So we talk about the monopoly mindset. We all grew up with the game Monopoly and it becomes winner take all. And that's really what has happened in politics. They just have end up with so much power and they end up being able to control everything. If you know, it's, it's, it's always more and more condensed in the hands of a few. But that doesn't have to be the case. And we also look at street art and how regular people can get their message out and it's you know it's amazing to see the protests that are happening now even amidst covid you know people are hungry to take their power back to get you know to fix this broken system so people can see our film online for free i think we finished it in 2014 um and you know the message is needed more than ever and we really need you know people to do everything they can from protecting our elections to ending gerrymandering to getting disclosure, you know, all of these solutions of how we can fix the system are in there, but it's, it's in a fun and entertaining way. You know, it's a, it's a tough topic, but we really wanted to make it palatable, you know, and I think now, more, now it's needed more than ever. Yeah. So, so the film actually really holds up. Um, although we couldn't imagine, how much it can hold up, <laughs> how, you know, yeah. how much has changed since then. Um, and, uh, and it also has a lot of ideas about things that people can do. So do you want to talk a little bit about that? Because we, you know, one of our goals with the Global Peace Film Festival is to encourage our audiences to do something about what they've seen. So, right. Um, yeah, well, it's always take action locally and take action federally. Like you can do the local, municipal, you can do the state level and you can do take action federally. You know, you can be calling your senators, you can be calling Congress, you know, right now currently protecting our vote with mail-in voting. You know, there, Trump's going on saying, oh no, mail-in voting when he votes by mail and a lot of Republicans vote by mail and they've never said it's an issue before. So 
there's a um, bill before Congress, you know, call Congress and ask them to protect both the post office so that the mail-in ballots get there and to protect our right to vote by mail, um, especially during this time. And yeah, they should also right. check locally. Um, yes. I know here in New York State, I have just spent the last few days um, going on the New York State Senate um, website and and signaling my support one by one by one of a whole array of very detailed ways to try and protect uh, absentee voting and to yep. protect um, uh, voting overall. For instance, uh, mail-in voting is something that's not the norm in New York State. Uh, with COVID, the, the governor signed a, a kind of quick executive order that allowed us to vote by mail without an excuse, mm -hmm. which is not normally allowed. And, um, and it, you know, uh, I know it sounds simple from the outside, but there were so many details that needed to be addressed between what we saw happen in the June primary and what we anticipate will happen in November, you know. Yeah, and we also actually made another film first and I consider, consider pay to play and free for all kind of a companion pieces. And that one was called Free for All. And that's also on our website for free. And it shows all the ways they can steal elections. And people really need to educate themselves on this topic. It's kind of, it's the topic I like working on the least because it's so weedy and there's so many different districts and it's like, you have to fix it in so many places. We could right. get federal bills that would protect it. But, you know, with people like Mitch McConnell holding up votes on secure elections, even though, you know, we've had concerns about, you know, both foreign interference and things happening on the inside, you know, that's those protections are not happening at the federal level, though they could. So I really encourage people to watch both films and educate on what's happening with elections and then the big money picture. And also encourage people to register to vote, of course. Yes. Registering is really critically important. Yeah. Um, and then making sure that people actually go out uh, to vote, um, yep. whether they early vote, vote by mail. And interestingly, usually vote by mail, um, Republicans do much better in vote by mail yep. than, than Democrats ever do. Yeah. Um, and know your state's laws. Like I'm originally from Wisconsin, I'm now in California, but there you have to have a witness sign your ballot and I, you have to send in a copy of your driver's license. So the obstacles wow. there for voting by mail are steep. I don't know if there will be anything locally to switch that given COVID. But it's, you know, and then how many people don't have driver's license? That's another form of voter suppression that's happened. You know, in, in Wisconsin, the last time the vote was down to about 22,000 votes and over 200,000 people couldn't vote because they didn't have the proper ID. So that's a form of voter suppression. You know, these voter ID bills when voter fraud is not, election fraud happens, but voter fraud, in-person voter fraud is really not the thing we should be concerned about, even though, you know, people try to red, wave that red flag of warning. It's in, not... in, in person voter fraud is like so negligible. Yeah. In terms of, you know, in terms of numbers. Yeah. But it is, it is such, a, such an important issue and two very important films. Do you want to talk a little bit more about, um, about free for all? Uh, Sure. So that one, we really followed both the 2000 election in Florida and the 2004 election in Ohio. As I mentioned, we finished it in 2008, but it's still, you know, everything is still happening. You know, voter misinformation is, a, you know, a classic thing. And just so, so many ways they try to oppress the vote. And because you saw the, the popular vote, was a very different result. If we didn't have this electoral college, I like to say they know how to slice and dice the electoral college, like with you know a razor blade thin margin and the same with the state legislatures with the gerrymandering, which we talk about in depth, you know, how they gerrymander districts. So, so many states there would be, if it was the popular vote, there'd be a much different balance of power in the state legislators legislature. <laughs> correct. Um, correct. <laughs> so 
it's really important. And if we all work together and work on these issues, you know, it's like so often, like I said, these topics are very heady and we want to we want to work on the things that really capture our heart more. But if we don't fix democracy issues, then we're not going to clean up our environment. Then we're not going to, you know, end poverty. We're not going to fix the criminal injustice system because it's all goes back to money, you know, the private prison systems and the, you know, people being detained by ICE and all the money they're making to hold people, you know, in prison with, when that's not what is right or just and the discriminate, you know, the racial discriminations there and just everything. We're not gonna fix it if we don't fix democracy issues first. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So why don't we take a step further back and uh, tell our audience uh, about um, bonsai people? And oh, sure. It's funny because I was making pay to play at the same time I was making bonsai people. And bonsai people is about when you can use money for good to help people and small amounts microcredit. So it was such a weird thing in my brain to be working on like the corrupting influence of big money in politics. And then like, wow, how $200 could help lift a family out of poverty by giving the women loans to start a business. And, you know, it took years to get out of poverty, but if they were able to use the money well for us, you know, small business income generating activities, as long as they didn't have a health issue, which is what usually, you know, bankrupts families, just like here, if you don't have health care, um, you know, you really could get your kids fed, you could keep them in school, you could, you could turn your, you could really improve your life when you were given that capacity to invest in yourself and keep the money local um, versus what we see in, you know, our country with Wall Street and all the money going, you know, to the bigger and bigger companies instead of keeping the money local. So I loved doing that film and seeing how these women were empowered. And it, there it was, um, I was in Bangladesh and uh, I filmed in 2007, 2008. And then I ended up finishing the film in 2011 and I got to go back. So I followed new borrowers who got their loans in 2007. And I got to see them again in 2011 after I'd, I'd followed them a couple of years and then did another last visit. And just seeing how they felt empowered, actually, because they would meet every week for the microcredit loan, you know, they'd give back, they'd make small payments weekly, but they'd have to come to the meeting once a week and they'd learn to speak up for themselves. So in a way, it was also a democratic process. And one of the women I followed actually had become a local councilwoman because she gained confidence, she got to know everybody in the village. And that was unheard of still, you know, in Bangladesh, the women's roles are still quite different than here. And to have be a woman on council is still unusual. And um, so it was so great to see not just the monetary impact, but the impact on the individual. So, so the other, the other um, part of the title is the vision of Muhammad Yunus who went on to he won the Nobel Peace Prize after you'd done the film or while you were doing the film? I think Holly's frozen. Uh -oh. A million women. At the time, we had six billion people on our planet. So I was like, that's one out of every thousand people on Earth. And he had done it all in my lifetime. I was born in 72 and he started with the famine of Bangladesh and was just trying to help you know, a few people and it just kept growing and, you know, through trial and error, it kept growing and growing. And then on top of that, he also started all these social businesses. So what microcredit ended up being was a social business where you still want to be profitable so that you can grow and do more work, but you always want to reinvest in the community and benefit the people. So like I said, there the money stays local and it really lifts up the, the villages. And you saw that with the, um, the, the, there were the goals of like 2015 to meet the poverty reduction. And Bangladesh was one of the few countries that actually met all the goals and they met early. And I think because they were lifting up the people at the very bottom that were most in poverty and neighboring India, even though um, it has more wealth overall, like they had, weren't able to lift up the bottom in the same way because their microcredit has been 
the Grameen Bank isn't even the largest microcredit group in the country, it's BRAC. And um, together they're just reaching so many people that it really elevated people overall. Um, so that was wonderful to see. Would it be, and, would it be fair? Holly, to, you know, because I keep thinking about how you said you were trying to hold both ideas. <laughs> Would yeah. it be fair to say in one respect um, that uh, with Muhammad Yunus, he was using this tool of money as, as a vehicle to, um, uh, to help people realize their agency as fully mm -hmm. as possible? And yes. unfortunately, in this country, they're using money as a tool to suppress individual agency and collective exactly. agency. Exactly. And sometimes simple things. So the women in, in Grameen program, when they got their loan, they also had to build a pit latrine if they didn't. So he helped create sanitation just by a simple rule. Right. And also, <laughs> if they were to get a, a, um, a certain loan, um, now I'm forgetting which because it's been a while, but the women had to get the land to be in their name as well. So he helped shift, you know, historically women own like 1% of the land in the world. Right. So he was able to empower the women which have historically been disempowered. Right. Um, so he made a simple rule that, and that, and, you know, keeps them secure because the, they could be divorced and out on the street, you know, just very easily, you know. So can people watch, uh bonsai people or is there is it available how is it yes that's at um bonsai well if you go to filmmakerforchange.com you can get links to all of the films so Great. i think and i have it on vimeo for a nominal you know oh, very good <laughs> and and for everybody out there listening we will have all of those links available that holly has mentioned on the mm -hmm. slide and in the chat yeah yep we will indeed so um, what are you working on now, Holly? Well, I adopted two kids from Brazil. It's been just under two years. So that is taking up most of my time. I was starting to think about another project and this all hit. So uh, I stay tuned because <laughs> <laughs> my uh, time for filmmaking is a little limited right now. <laughs> But, you know, the, the juices are, are growing. We also finished one called The Price of Privatization that I have yet to put online. Um, and I should just get that up on YouTube and put it up on our page. And maybe I can get that done in the next oh, day so or two. Because that kind of goes hand in hand with, Sounds you know. Like yeah, so we have that one. Um, I, we just, I got so busy. Uh, with the kids and <laughs> well let us know and we will certainly yeah. point people toward it if, uh, okay. if you decide to do we like to yeah. we like to keep shining the light on our alumni filmmakers <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes indeed we do so um well thank you for this interesting conversation and important conversation at this point mm -hmm. in time um and people can continue to uh, you know, to watch this on our Facebook page uh, after we finish this recording. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to come in and like engage with people when I have time, you know, late at uh -huh. night, get back on, and, <laughs> you know, engage with people on this topic because, you know, there's so many ways we can get involved. Yeah. And fi figuring out which, where your niche is, is I think important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And there, there is so much people can do. And it's so important to actually, you know, get engaged, um, you know, at the very least, make sure you're registered and vote yourself. Yep. Um, and uh, get your, you know, get your friends, family, neighbors to, to register and vote. And then there's so much more beyond that that you can do. Yes. So, um, so Holly Mosher, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I have to uh, share the screen uh -huh. okay. so people can see. Uh, these are um, this is these are some of the uh, links to see Holly's work, and um, we look forward to staying in touch and hearing more about your upcoming. You know what what your next project is going to be. Um, and, and thank you all for tuning in and joining us. 
and uh, we have another uh, Global Peace Film Festival Lives Online event next Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern, uh, 4 p.m. on the West Coast. And that is with Valerie Carr, who's gonna be discussing her new book. Um, mm -hmm. And we are very much, we had a film of hers uh, several years ago in the festival, and then we look very much forward to, to talking to her. Um, so thank you all for joining us and, um, and have a good evening. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Holly.